the dynamic of polarity. And in the world of polarity, we have safely operated, conveniently operated, in the world of right and wrong, good and bad, masculine, feminine, left and right, winner, loser, which has ordered our understanding of what justice is, which has ordered our understanding of truth, two sides, right or wrong, left or right, winner, loser, loser, winner, winner, loser, however we think. So we always think in terms of two, duality, that there are just two sides to everything. Hi, everybody. Another archetype video. This week, I've decided to do the judge. <laughs> because, I mean, <clears throat> we are in the midst of a legal season, shall we say. And so I thought, well, it's time for the judge. Now, when we think about the judge archetype, and I mean the archetype, I think what comes to mind within the Western world is the iconic story of Solomon, because he represents, that story represents the pinnacle of what the judge and wisdom and the, the wise, the capacity to separate from the two people involved in an issue and ascend to a level of wisdom. And it's, as you remember the story, it is about two women who both claim a baby is theirs. And his way of deciding was said, cut the baby in half and give half to each woman, knowing that the real mother would say, no, 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 she can have the baby. And that's how he realized that when the one woman said, fine, that works for me. And the other one said, absolutely not. He knew that that was the real mother. And there, and that gives us a sense, the story of what wisdom was all about, what it was to be able to clearly see beyond the two people, beyond favoritism, beyond what tribes they may have been from or what families they may have been from, but rather what it is to clearly discern, <clears throat> to use a higher order discernment in making a decision. And so the, <clears throat> we speak openly about the wisdom of Solomon. We need the wisdom of Solomon to make judgments in order to see clearly because what that established in sort of a major archetypal cosmic way was that the judgment, you know, at this is the capacity to see clearly is to recognize we'll never know all the details. We'll never know all the facts. We'll, <clears throat> we can only work with what's in front of us to the best of our ability. And at the same time, the capacity to, to disassociate from details that are not significant to the decision at hand. I am reminded of my favorite story in the scripture, and it is my favorite, and that's the story of Job, um, which is, uh, the book of Job is a book that I, I read every year. I just adore that particular book in the scripture, in the Old Testament, and I, I must say that <clears throat> if I ever thought a book was divinely inspired, it has to be the book of Job, and the entire exchange between Yahweh and Job when when he says, where were you when I laid the foundations of this universe? Who are you to, to question how I ordered this universe, how I hung the stars and I hung the planets? And <clears throat> if you read it, excuse me, if you read Job and think about when it was written, you know, thousands of years ago, how did the author of that book in the Old Testament, which what is now the Old Testament, what became the Old Testament, 
How did he know to describe the cosmos the way he did? Or the planet the way he did? Or to mention snow-capped mountains? How, how, how did he describe this planet so thoroughly? As if he traveled it, as if he, he knew that there were multiple planets, multiple, I mean, how did he know? How did he know? It's as if an angel took his pen, his quill, and scripted this and said, this is what it looks like. It was the last time Yahweh spoke directly to a human being. He, as he had spoken to Abraham and spoken to Moses and Noah, it was the last time. And he said, justice is mine. I know what's going on in this world. I ordered this universe. I created it. And so this book has, <clears throat> has a striking resonance with me, especially when it comes to justice. And it always has. It has stuck with me. And because it, it especially, especially, as we now enter into this psychic universe in which we now dwell, a psychic intuitive universe that is shifting our um, capacity to, let me say it this way, that is moving us out of the dynamic of polarity. And in the world of polarity, we have safely operated, conveniently operated, in the world of right and wrong, good and bad, masculine, feminine, left and right, winner, loser, which has ordered our understanding of what justice is which has ordered our understanding of truth, two sides, right or wrong, left or right, winner, loser, loser, winner, winner, loser, or however we think. So we always think in terms of two, duality, that there are just two sides to everything. And that's the nature of polarity. And polarity operates at this particular type of physical dimension, body, soul, right? Uh, heaven, earth, polarity. But what if we are now moving from this archetype of polarity into an archetypal dynamic that is more of a hologram? more of a holism, more of a, think of it as popping yourself out of polarity and stretching your psychic muscle into a different dimension of consciousness that instead of being so linear, right, wrong, left, right, up, down, male, female, we are now moving into one of vertical time, out of horizontal, where everything is so yesterday, today, tomorrow, to more of a vertical time, more of a where multiple dimensions are beginning to blend into, so we have a physical dimension, an emotional dimension, an energetic dimension, and other dimensions that are weaving their way into the psychic content of our life. It is an extraordinary thing to, comp to, to even consider, <coughs> much less comprehend, but I think this is happening. And I think this is part of what's ha what has compelled us into the evolution of our psychic sensory system, what is making us more attuned to invisible energetic data, and all of that, 
all of that is 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 why we now speak about um, influences from other lifetimes, for example, that maybe the way the reason this is happening now is because it's karma. It's because it's something from another lifetime or maybe something from a future lifetime, dare we think. Because if there's something from past and present in the world of timelessness, in the world of timelessness, it is all the same thing. It is an incomprehensible thing for us in the here and now to even consider such a thing. And yet, what if, what if that is the size of the consciousness into which we're evolving? Which brings me back to judgment, to this sense of <clears throat> why do things happen as they do? How do we know why things happen? How do, one of the reasons I do not do medical intuitive readings anymore, anymore, I won't do them, is because you have to excuse me, I, I feel like I have a piece of something, pepper in my throat or something. One of the reasons I don't, and it is actually the main reason, is because the more readings I did, the more complex we became. Complex in the sense that I realized that our energetic nature had a timelessness to it, a timeless quality to it. When I started, when I started, I started with the assumption that all of the stress patterns in you came from your immediate history, from this lifetime, from something that happened to you a year ago, 10 years ago, childhood, whatever, but your history. So I, I operated from the here and now in the past. I had this dimensional thing going on, right? But as the years went by and my sense of confidence increased and my, my sense of the cosmos began to expand and expand. And I realized that there was a lot more to us than met the eye that our energetic nature was not bound by what we think of as history, by past, but, if, but our past was as fluid as what we think of as future. Um, that people wanted one cause to be responsible for why they weren't well. And, and their reasoning was always, and this again goes back to judgment, their reasoning was that if they could find the one thing that they had done wrong, they could do it right, and this judge archetype that they assumed was God, that God had the judge archetype, their idea of God was that there was an off-planet God who had the judge archetype that they must have done something wrong and that if they could just write it, then their health, they would be rewarded because that's how a judge works. They would be let out of prison, the prison of their illness. They would be rewarded with their health and not just their health, but happiness and their youth and everything would come back to them. People believe this because they're caught in the, 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 the childlike belief that bad things happen to bad people. But if you're a good person, the judge God will protect you and bad things won't happen to you because you're a good person and bad things only happen to bad people. And so this is how this idea, uh, uh, so this idea of, just find me the one cause, and then everything will be just fine. And at first, I operated on that. I thought, okay, well, there must be like one incident, one trauma, one bad, one bad day in your childhood. But the more I looked at that, the more I went on these kind of search and destroy missions psychically, 
<clears throat> trying to unearth these traumas because your biography is your biology. The more I realized that is just not true. That is not true at all. That we are a complex of so many choices. And that's how I understood the power of choice. That every single choice created a consequence. And that consequence blended with <clears throat> the choices of who knows how many other choices we made. And that it was ultimately this extraordinary constant flow of creation that was based on how we interacted with our experience of creation, our experience of creation, and how we what how we saw our values, how we saw the purpose of our life, whether the purpose of our life was <clears throat> to take or to give, to grow or to sit still. All of these factors, all of these factors were choices in themselves that had constant, constant consequences that simply constantly fed our psychic field. And that that in itself was always producing other choices <clears throat> that we were never that simple. <clears throat> I beg your pardon. We were never that simple. We were this complex system. And the same is true. It, that same complexity of the hologram that is us applies to when I would say to somebody, why do you think you did this? Why, why, why do you feel this way? Why did you make this choice? There's never one reason for why you do what you do. And here comes judge, the judge. The mystical journey is, it, it, the wisdom of the mystical journey is that to know thyself is to know the universe in you is to know the nature of the universe, is to realize, is there really one reason why I do anything? Is there really one reason why I feel the way I do about anything? And if there isn't, what, <clears throat> what are the reasons for why I am who I am? F what? And if, and if I am that complex, so is everyone else. So is everyone else. If I am that <clears throat> rich a, a being, so full of possibilities, if choice is that powerful, then I must, I must select discernment before I make a choice. I must think very clearly because all the choices I make have extraordinary consequences, extraordinary, larger than I know, greater than I know, greater than I'll ever know, because that's how complex you are. And one of the choices is that there is to <clears throat> dismantle the idea that there's a cosmic judge that somehow regulates your well-being through punishment or protection based upon your choices. What I have come to learn is that God is law, is that God is law. The nature of God is law. And here again, the judge and discernment that the nature of God is absolutely law. And that law operates within all of nature, within all of our bio-spiritual ecology, and that the laws of nature operate our health, operate this universe, and that that is the nature of God. There is no punishing God. It's a God of choice and consequence, action and reaction. That is a God of fairness that levels the playing field. And again, that brings us to this place of 
discernment, how we make choices, and that our choices play out according to the intention that we put into those choices, blended with who knows what other forces we've already set into motion. And among those choices would be grace if you chose to add grace. If you had the discernment, like Solomon, to add wisdom and grace into a choice that said, help me to make a choice here, to not judge a circumstance from a lesser place, which is worth speaking about now. What makes judgment corrupt? What makes judgment corrupt? What makes your judgments corrupt? And that's that when you assume that you have the polarity, that you have to win, that you're always right, that, that you, that justice has to be on your side, that the other side never has a legitimate argument that, and th this is a tough, this is difficult because, you know, you have situations like murder. Well, obviously, obviously the murderer is the bad person, right? And yet, and here I'm on dicey ground. I'm going to own that. I'm going to own that. But I'm going to take the risk of saying that, remember the Dalai Lama story. And this is after the Chinese military invaded Tibet. And they, he, they slaughtered how many of his monks, hundreds and hundreds of his monks. And this reporter said to him, how do you feel about these horrible Chinese soldiers, right? And he was hoping to go the, the Dalai Lama into saying something politically controversial, like those horrible Chinese people, right? But he didn't. His response was, I feel compassion. I feel compassion. And the reporter was disappointed. He was disappointed. He was like, compassion? It, this is an impersonal universe. It's not a personal universe. And this, it takes extraordinary discernment an extraordinary grace to get to a place where you see yourself, your life, your own life, and the events of your life as both incredibly intimate and totally impersonal. Because both are true. Both are true. It coming to that truth, and it is a truth because it applies to everybody and everything, is what helped to make me an incredibly good medical intuitive. I realized that everybody's journey, that, for example, the mother archetype, the judge archetype, any archetypal pattern, is a completely impersonal pattern. It's impersonal. There'll be a mother archetype long before all of you were mothers and long after you'll die and be gone. Motherhood will continue. It has nothing to do with you, all of you who are mothers. Nothing. Motherhood was not created for you. It will outlast you. But as soon as you became a mother, it became intimate to you. So it is two things, totally impersonal and totally intimate. And that is true of everything in life. It is also true of all the experiences we have, even car theft. It's totally impersonal. People have their car, people's cars are stolen all the time, and then it becomes intimate when it's yours. And the reasons cars are stolen, <clears throat> totally impersonal for, for parts. It's have and have nots. I want it because I, I don't have it and I like your car. And it's the reasons are totally impersonal and all the same and totally intimate because now it's your insurance company. Both are true. Both are, 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 are involved 
in every single experience we have. Again, it takes discernment and clear judgment to see this. And where negative judgment comes in is when a person says, it only happens to me. It only happens to me. Where a person is incapable of rising to that higher level and caves and plays the victim. The victim is the lowest form of that low form of conscious. This only happens to me. I'm just suffering. It's just only me. Look at, look at all the bad things that are happening to me. And it's a powerless position. It is the ultimate powerless position because it, it is a position of saying, I have no power inside of me whatsoever. None. The world is against me and there's nothing I can do. And it's their fault, their fault, their fault. And there's nothing I can do, which is totally against the purpose of life. The purpose of life is what you can do. The power you have within you to do something in every moment, in every moment. And to actually look at every moment, not to judge it as something that overwhelms you, but to rise to discernment and to say, what can I do? What am I able to do that is transcendent of the power of this moment? So that I am not victimized, so that I do not turn and blame others for why I am in the situation I am. Now, not everybody has the judge archetype as an occupation. There are judges, and it is some, for some people it's a profession. They're lawyers, they're mediators, they're peacemakers, they're wise people, they're spiritual directors, they're, they're physicians, they're healers, they're law officers. They're, 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 it's also the judge is just a strong, some their mothers, fathers, wise people. But we all have an active element of the judge in us and that we all battle judgmentalism and we all have to make judgments. And that is what, that's how our consciousness evolves. And so I offer you the teaching of judgment and discernment as a way of realizing you have choice not to fall prey to being a victim or to be caught in the duality of I've got to win or I lose, but that there are other options of, well, maybe there's a third way. Maybe there's compromise. Maybe there's third way. Maybe there are other options. There, maybe there's the way of Solomon. Thank you, everybody.